afternoon. Welcome back to another episode with Divorce at Altitude. I'm Amy Gosha with Kalamea Gosha, and today I have the pleasure of having Joan McWilliams with me today. We are talking about parenting plans. Joan, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for coming on as an expert guest um, today. So um, I just wanted to introduce you to our listeners. Can you tell me just a little bit about your background and how you got into family law and working on parenting plans and, you know, those types of matters? Well, it was a transition, shall we say. Uh, after I got divorced some years ago, yeah. I decided that maybe I could go to law school and was able to put that together. It took quite a few years, but I did put it together. Yeah. I graduated and clerked for a Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals judge and then went with a large law firm in Denver. I became a partner there and decided that I didn't like it very much. I liked the firm, but I didn't. I was not a good litigator because I can't be mean. And it was right about that time that mediation was sort of being introduced across the country. And when I took a mediation training, I thought this is where I belong. And I withdrew from the partnership, started my own mediation firm, and was doing it for about 30 years. Oh, I think. awesome! Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I think um, I definitely have mediated with you. You're an awesome mediator, and I know you've also written a few books. Can you tell me about the books that you've written? Well, the first book that I wrote was, uh, in fact, I brought copies of them. The first book that I wrote was is Parenting Plans for Families After Divorce. And the idea was that what I was seeing lawyers do was ignore the family and only concentrate on their client, which who was either the mother or the father. And yet after the divorce was over, the mother and father had to go back to the children and somehow reconstruct that family after divorce. So that's the theme of that book. Mm -hmm. The other book is A Parent's Guide to Understanding the Conflict, um, the Effects of Conflict and Divorce. And that springs from my introduction to the Adverse Childhood Experiences study, which I will mention later on. Great. Thank mm -hmm. you, Joan. And I actually just ordered your book on Amazon. Um, you know, I, I recently told you I went through a divorce and have a two and a half year old. So I'm looking forward to reading that. Um, so I appreciate you coming on today. Um, I think, where should we start? Should we, um, in Colorado, I guess, you know, we should talk about what the court looks at when determining, you know, what a parenting plan should sure, be. Sure. You know, for, for those of you who don't know, those of you in the audience, um, a parenting plan is a legal document. It's a document that you create with your spouse, former spouse, uh, or it is one that the judge creates. It is entered into the court record as an order. It becomes an order and it is enforceable. So it's a very important document and one to take very seriously. There are three parts to a parenting plan. The first one would be, how are you going to make major decisions for your child or children? We'll go through these more specifically. The second would be, how are the kids going to spend time with you and the other parent? That would be monthly parenting time, holiday parenting time, and vacation parenting time. And then people often include a dispute resolution provision. If we, if we can't agree on something, what do we do? We go to mediation, we go to arbitration, and we'll talk about that as well. Yeah. And so as a mediator, um, it, did you help um, parties work through and create parenting plans? Yes, yes. And it's, a, it's an intricate process because each case is different. Interestingly, it started in England. Did yeah, you know that? No, I didn't. Yeah, let's talk about the history. I love you know, this. Because it's like as lawyers, we are like, we need to do a parenting plan, but we don't know where the history came from. Well, right? it came um, in, in, uh, in, historically in England, under common law, the father always got custody of the children. That was because the children were considered property and he had to support them. And the mother had no rights in any event. Mm -hmm. So the kids always went with the father until, I think it was 1839, 1639, something like that. Yeah. 1839, and a woman in England lost custody of her children and decided this was enough. She was going to fight this. And so she went to Parliament and she, um, they enacted the um, Custody of Infants Act, if you will, which gave a presumption of custody to the mother. That was also, come. we came to know that as the Tender Years Doctrine, and that was, in effect, 
you know, as I said, we we translated some of the English law that became law in the United States for a long time until the end of the 20th century, in fact, when legislators started enacting best interest statutes. And that's the law today. So the court has to consider the best interests of the child in determining the parenting time and the decision making. Yeah. So if, um, you know, as a mediator or even as a lawyer, um, you know, how would you describe what the best interest factors are? Well, the best interests are listed in the statute. And I like to think that judges really pay attention to them. Do you think they do? I think certain factors. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, so in considering the best interest, the court must consider the wishes of the parents and the wishes of the child if the child is old enough to uh, express those desires. The court will look at the interaction and interrelationship of the child with his parents and other siblings. The court wants to know what the parent's ability to encourage love, affection, and contact with the other parent would be, unless they're protecting a child from domestic violence, neglect, or child abuse. And the court is very interested and must make a finding on whether the past pattern of involvement of the parties with the child reflects a system of values, time commitment, and mutual support. Also looks at physical proximity of the parents and how that affects how they'll make decisions. Right. When it comes to parenting time, which we used to call visitation, they'll also look at the physical proximity, among other things. Mm -hmm. So they must find that the provisions of the parenting plan are in the child's best interest. Interestingly, the child has rights, and they are in the statute. The child has a right to have determinations made that are in his best interest. Hmm. I don't think that existed in, <laughs> in England. <laughs> right. Um, the child has a right to be emotionally, mentally, and physically safe when in the care of either parent. And the child has a right to reside in and visit in homes that are free of domestic violence and child abuse or neglect. Those are fairly recent yeah. provisions. Right. Um, one, one piece on the best interest factors before we segue into another area is, mm -hmm. um, you know, talking to judges a lot of times, you know, I do ask like if they look at, you know, all of the factors and some of them will say that, you know, they'll put certain weight on some of them. And, you know, a lot of times they'll look at the parent's ability to put the needs of the children above their own and their ability to effectuate the child's relationship with the other parent. Would you say that, you know, those two factors are pretty important? I think those are important. And and one of the one of the problems with our judicial system is that many of the domestic relations judges are new. In fact, it's a policy that when a judge is appointed to the bench they often get put in domestic relations because it's an easy area of the law when in fact it's not one bit easy exactly it's very complicated and we end up with judges who some of them don't know what they're doing uh some of them do some of the lawyers don't know what they're yeah, doing either um but but we're trying to um change that we're trying to say if if you're going to be a judge on the domestic bench you have to have practiced in domestic law it's complicated and it's it's it, it, you get into very complex financial issues not to mention the the emotional the developmental issues of children um and so we're hoping to get a higher quality judge on the on the bench that is not to say and i'm very careful to say that we don't have good judges because we do right but we sh we have come to expect to see new judges on the domestic bench and it's not a place for new new judges. Yeah, and I also think it's just, um, you know, the family, figuring out if the family system really, you know, the traditional court um, setting is where, a, you know, family system should be. So, you know, that's also part of the issue that I think you right. know, we're, we're constantly trying to resolve. If a family, if parents can come up with their own solution, especially with the child, uh, issues. They may they may ask the judge to decide the financial issues, but if they can agree on the child issues and put their child first 
and come to some agreement about how they're going to treat that child, they're winners. They're absolute winners and they will raise a child that is well adjusted and if you will, leaves home when he's 21. Right. <laughs> Doesn't live with mom and dad for the rest of his life. Yes, I heard you mention put the child first. You know, that's probably a pretty, car you know, a number one cardinal rule when yes. dealing with a co-parent is put the child first. Put the child first. And it, and it goes on and on. It's put the child first when you're looking at a new spouse. Put the child first when you're looking at educational decisions. Put the child first all the time. Right. Is there anything else, Joan, you wanted to talk about relating to the best interest factors before we actually dive more into the parts of a parenting plan? I think we've covered that. Okay, great. Um, I think we'll turn our attention to, you know, you had mentioned there's three parts to a parenting plan. Can you go into that in more depth um, so our listeners kind of understand, you know, the parts of a parenting plan and what they should be thinking about when, when um, putting them together? Yes. Um, we've got we've got three pieces. How are you going to make major decisions for your child? That's health, education, and general welfare. Second is how is the child going to spend time with each of you? That's the parenting time, and then a dispute resolution provision. So with regard to the decision making, um, I usually start with health. And it can be as complex or as simple as you want, but a lot of people include provisions for um, who, the, who the pediatrician is going to be or the doctor, the dentist. Does the child need counseling? Uh, do the parents need counseling? Do you need family counseling? This is where you would write that in. Um, you're each entitled to receive or to have access to your child's medical records, and that's by statute. Um, some parents get very um, confused about who gives the child medicine, who picks up the medicine, who pays for the medicine, where does the medicine stay, Do you, does it go back and forth with the child? It, it can get so contorted that you just, you just shake your head and you go, whoa, this, is not, this should not be this complicated if the child needs the medicine, how are you going to get it to them? Right. But that, is, that has been an issue. The same with vaccinations. Um, should the child be vaccinated or not? One parent might say, no, no vaccinations. Not, that was before COVID, no vaccinations. Um, another parent absolutely insists on getting the child vaccinated. And for those, if they can't agree on it, you almost have to have a judge or an arbitrator make that decision. Right. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing a lot more of the vaccination issues, I think. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, I didn't know yeah. That. So parents don't want to have the COVID vaccination? Um, well, just vaccinations in general. We see a lot of parents who um, maybe they had a family member that had an adverse, you know, like um, reaction to one of the normal vaccinations, but in order to be in, you know, child, you know, child care center, the child needs to be vaccinated. So, you know, that does come up, I think, pretty frequently, at least I've seen within the last year or so. I had a case years ago where one parent said no vaccinations, the other parent wanted vaccinations. They agreed that when the vaccination became an issue, they would consult a traditional uh, pediatrician and a holistic pediatrician. Mm -hmm. They would talk and see, was this necessary? Were the, were the fears or the risks, did they outweigh the benefits? And mm -hmm. One day the father took the child in for a phys physical exam and the nurse said, oh my gosh, he hasn't had his vaccinations. Mm -hmm. Here, I'll take care of that. And it was done. And then took all the And the mother was not happy. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> wow. So I think um, before we talk about the parenting time, one thing um, that I think the listeners need to understand is that in Colorado, like you mentioned, we don't have the term visitation anymore. It's allocation of parental responsibilities. And then that's broken up into essentially two sections, the decision making, uh, major decision making for the children, um, and then also parenting time. Right. So that's kind of the framework. So you were talking about decision making. We were making. talking about decision making. So we have health, and then we have education. Uh, where's the child going to go to school? This too is a controversy. Will it be private school? Will it be public school? Will it be a school near mother's house or near dad's house? You know, we can go on and on 
and yet the child has to get enrolled in a school. Right. What happens if one parent moves? So it can get very complex. Um, how about going attending parent-teacher conferences? Can both parents go? Can they go together? That saves the teachers some time. Um, can they go to school plays? Can they participate in the child's cat classroom activities? These are all part of that education decision. So we have health, education, and general welfare. Uh, general welfare, there are lots of different provisions that people can add. I've seen more and more parents reach agreements on social media. How are they going to monitor that in each home? Right. When do the cell phones go out of the kids' hands up on the shelf so they can go to sleep? Is that 8.30? Is it 9? Um, the complications come with that where one parent is not monitoring at all, so they have total access to all the different social media networks and to their telephones, and they will be on their phones till 2 or 3 in the morning. And then they go back to the other parent's house, and they're not allowed to do that, and it causes great controversy and confusion for the kids. Yeah, because I get a lot of parents who, as the kids get older, you know, they're saying, well, you know, my kid is saying that I, you know, they want to be at either dad or mom's house, you know, I want to modify parenting time. And then I find out that, you know, one parent isn't monitoring social media and, it's, and you, can, you know, no wonder why the kid wants to be over at the other That's right. parent's That's right. house, yeah. you know? Yeah. So it's like you have to dig deeper on those issues. And that would be a decision under the general welfare provision. Right. But there are lots of them. Um, I've had cases where they... One parent does not want the child to be around a relative of the other parent, and we have to figure that out. So it gets very complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think yeah, that's in decision making. And then um, under parenting time, um, you had mentioned, you know, what are the different types of parenting time that parents need to reach agreements on? Well, they use, parents usually start by talking about monthly parenting time. How is the child going to spend time with each of them? Uh, that's really... It's, it's very um, geared to the child's developmental age. Very young children may not be able to be away from either parent for very long, but perhaps can't spend a lot of consecutive overnights with one parent or the other. So how do you balance that? How do you make sure that each parent is spending enough time with the child so that the child really bonds with that parent? As the, as the kid gets older, they can spend more time away from each of them, and that will change the parenting time. Unfortunately, our parent, the number of overnights is geared to the child support amount. And so if you have more overnights with each parent, the child support is going to be lower. Right. Um, but now we have a provision that says, yeah, but if mom takes care of the kid most of the time during the day, child support can be adjusted. So that's been alleviated somewhat. I think at least you can have that discussion. So that's the monthly parenting time that will change as the child gets older. Um, different people have different theories on what's appropriate. I have had clients say, I don't want my child going back and forth at all. And they spend all the time with one parent, but, but do a lot of activities with the other parent. We have a friend whose child, they, they, uh, he, he lived, the, this friend of ours lived in one house. His former wife lived in, just down the street, and the kid went back and forth every other night. Oh, yeah, because of the proximity. Until he got tired of it, and then they switched it out. Mm -hmm. and, you know, as they get older, kids don't want to go back and forth, so you have to make adjustments. How are, you don't want to lose that bond with either parent. So how do you figure that out? Yeah, I think that really hits home when you said that, you know, it's going to be so much better for the parents to make, you know, the decision for the children instead of having a judge look at it because oh, yes. every situation is so unique. I guess one other point that I look at from, you know, when I represent clients is I also look at, you know, what are the child's activities, their needs, you know, are they on an IEP? program? Do they need certain therapies? But then I also look at the schedules of the parents, um, you know, when looking at a parenting plan, because right. you also have to look at what's practical, because you might have a client that comes in and says, you know, I've been, I work 80 hours a week, but I want 50% of the time. And it's like, you have to have that 
reality check with yeah. them. That's good. And some parents will build in a vacation from the children. So the other parent has to take the kids for two weeks each year. I, I kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just to get every. Okay. So yeah, we've, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, regular parenting time. What are the other um, types of parenting time that are included in parenting? Well, then we plan? have holiday parenting time. And so this, um, the parents will choose the holidays that are most important to them. Maybe it's Christmas. Maybe it's a religious holiday, uh, Easter, that type of thing. And, and how is that going to be divided and shared? Some will share it. Uh, some will divide, for example, winter break. And uh, others will alternate it each year. It gets it gets complicated because those holidays, religious and uh, religious and non-religious, are very important to people. And then we have um, the the school breaks. So we talked about winter break, spring break, summer vacation. Mm -hmm. Totally changes the parenting time. Um, what activities are they going to be in? Like you said, yeah. Uh, how are you going to accommodate those? And I also look at, um, depending on what school district they're in, like what are the breaks to make sure that, you know, we've covered the all of the holidays or when the kids are off mm -hmm. for certain breaks. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's always good to make sure you have the school calendar too. Yeah. And then we have um, vacation parenting time. And usually they'll say, well, we'll take two or three weeks vacation parenting time. The holiday time and the vacation time supersede the monthly parenting time except that you can't take vacation on the other parents holiday parenting time right <laughs> and then what if a client or you know someone that's in mediation with you says well you know what happens after you know vacation i missed my regular you know weekend um you know is that made up or does the rotation start what happens with regular parenting time usually um I have clients sit down and take a look at what's fair, but I have also had clients who come in and say, I had 1,262 hours with my child last year and that is not, a, you know, so again, it depends on the personality of the parents and, and, and what they're able to adjust and accommodate. Um, at the end of the day, I think that if, if children um, sense hostility between their parents it's so much worse than one extra overnight it I I like parents to think that to look at the big picture and to think that they're you know it won't be long before the child's gone yeah and you want them to grow into healthy strong adults and constant fighting constant bickering is going to hurt them. Yeah. So, I mean, you and I talked about, you know, you can try to come up with the perfect parenting plan, but you've got to be aware of the damage that you create with conflict and that exposing to the children. Can you talk a little bit about that, Jen? I will. I, I was introduced to a concept several years ago that I actually had never heard of, and I think a lot of lawyers had never heard of, mm -hmm. and that was the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. You, I've always had, for all these years, had a sense that high conflict damages children, but I didn't have anything to pin it to or measure it by. And that's what the Adverse Childhood Experiences study does. It's known as ACEs. Basically, what there were two doctors in California, one was with Kaiser Permanente and one was with the Center for Disease Control, gave us gave questions to 17 over 17,000 participants in Kaiser the Kaiser plan and there were 10 questions and they they were questions about uh, physical abuse that these people had suffered as children emotional abuse um, what else S toxic stress mm -hmm. And then also, if they had been exposed to uh, any sort of sexual child abuse, if they had seen uh, a family member or someone in their household incarcerated, there were 10 questions, and whether they had been exposed to sexual abuse as well. There were 10 questions that required a yes or no answer. And at the end of their 10 questions, you, you added up the yes questions. 
And the more yeses you had, the more apt you were to experience um, negative negative things in your adult life. Negative things like um, alcoholism, drug abuse, suicide, depression, teen pregnancy, high risk behavior, and certain physical diseases, and potentially a shortened lifespan. This shocked me <laughs> that they could actually measure this, but indeed they did. Mm -hmm. It's been studied extensively. It, well, they did their study in 1997. It's been studied extensively since then, mm -hmm. and it stands really as a milestone for our understanding of what happens to adults when they've been abused as children. Right. But we're not talking just, we're not talking terrible daily physical abuse or sexual abuse. These are things like verbal abuse, um, which can happen often in a divorce, or abandonment, which there are times when you have a clear cut case of abandonment, a parent leaves. Yeah. And what do you do with that? But there's also emotional abandonment if you have a parent who is on a computer all the time during parenting time and completely ignoring the children. And it sounds a little extreme, but I have seen cases like that. Um, there's, of course, there is sexual abuse. There is physical abuse. Um, verbal abuse was very interesting to me because I've seen cases where parents you know, they're coming from their own experience and they scream at the children all the time and it damages, it actually does brain damage. But we have, the, the ACEs study was done in 1997. We've changed our society. And I think that there's two more categories of things that are damaging the children. Uh, one would be the effect that social change has on children. And this would ex include uh, cyberbullying or direct bullying, threat of school or community shootings. Mm -hmm. I saw an interview with a child, a, a high school kid, who was walking into school. The interviewer said, what do you think about when you walk? What's the first thing you think about when you walk into school? Mm -hmm. And she said, where to hide? Oh. That was her first, first thought. Uh, violent video games, suicide of a friend. Uh, suicide of a parent, verbal abuse, and social violence, parental op opioid addiction. So that's, we have 10 questions on the ACEs questionnaire. This is the 11th category with mm -hmm. another 10 questions. And now I think we can add the COVID uh, era. Right. What has that done to children? Um, have you experienced the death of a loved one? What are the long-term effects that you see on a loved one? Have you lost friendships? Uh, is there increased tension within the family? And do you have a failure, a sense of failure from your inability to learn online? Uh, do you have a computer? Because a lot of these children don't. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed your parents increase fighting? And have you lost hope for return to a normal situation? Add to that the fear of political unrest and the climate change or disasters. And we have kids that are under constant stress. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. And and I think, why is this so important? And if you bear with me, I yeah. just have a few more things. One in five teens will experience depression during their adolescence. And that was measured before COVID. We know that in 2014, Suicide became the leading cause of death among 10 to 17 year olds, and that has increased. And the number of kids entering foster care, if you can imagine, has more than doubled since 2000 due to the parental drug use. This one really wow. got me. There was a study done of 86 school shooters. Uh -huh. Of the 86 school shooters, 56 of them either grew up in dysfunctional families or without their parents together for at least part of their lives. And then we know from a former study in Douglas County that 80% of the kids, 80% of the kids entering the juvenile justice system experience their parents' high conflict divorce or abandonment. So I think these are things that, as I said, you can create the most perfect parenting plan that looks wonderfully great on paper, 
But if you're not paying attention to your children, if you're not placing them first, you may have problems. Yeah, and really big problems, like you said, you know, depression, yeah. suicide, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you're right, it's, it's slight things that you wouldn't even probably think as a parent, like a parent who's busy with work and just constantly on their iPhone. Yes. You know, yeah. that, that could have a really detrimental effect on their child. Or even leaving when parents separate, mm -hmm. one parent walks out of the house. Are, do they really mean to abandon them? No, probably not. But it feels like abandonment to the child, and it goes to their nervous system. Right. Um, so that kind of brings me to, you know, what are some tips that you have, you know, for co-parents? Um, you know, what are some best practice, practices to stay child-focused? Well, I think, and and I put these in my in that first book on families of divorce, mm -hmm. I think unconditioned love for the children. Mm -hmm. um, they're not always lovable, and they're not always great, but they want to know that you love them, right or wrong. They don't do well in school. They know that you're behind them and that they have a cheerleader. And, and then parents, be a parent. Um, use common sense. How often have we seen parents who go to the kids' soccer match and have a fight right. um, in front of all their friends? Or a child who does has a total meltdown when he sees both mom and dad coming to the school play. Mm -hmm. Isn't that sad? And it's so unnecessary. And then I think letting your child be a kid. Freedom to be a, freedom to be a kid. Mm -hmm. Remember, too, that your children are grieving the loss of their family, even though you may make every effort to make it pretty acceptable to your child, it's a loss. And they will grieve just as you grieve. And they should be allowed to grieve. If they need the support of a therapist, they should, you should seek that out mm -hmm. for them because it's important that they get through that stage successfully. Security, help them feel secure. And this is very difficult, I know, during COVID, especially when so many people have lost their jobs mm -hmm. and it's scary for children. It's scary for adults, but I think keep reassuring them, let them know that it's going to be all right, that you will provide food and necessities. Make sure that you support their educational efforts because that's their key to success. That's how they will move out into the world. And so to the extent that you make sure they're doing their homework, Make sure that they're understanding their math. If they don't, can you get extra help for them? Uh, don't hesitate to do that. And don't hesitate to talk to the teachers about any issues. Again, with divorced parents, you want both parents to do that. It's very difficult to set rules and boundaries that are consistent with the rules and boundaries in the other parent's home. But if you can do that, if you can match up your rules, it's much easier on the children. Yeah, just having the, you know, mm -hmm. that creates stability, having the same routine instead of having to think, oh, I'm in mom's house, oh, I'm in dad's this house. Is, yeah, it's, I once, sometimes in my mediation practice, I, I interviewed children when I was asked to do mm -hmm. so, and I had a 16-year-old come in, mm -hmm. and she smacked her backpack down on the table, and she said, I need to tell you something. I'm all done with this. <laughs> I've been going back and forth between my parents' home every other week. I have to pack up my backpack on Friday. I, ha I can't fill it too full because I don't want the other kids to know I'm switching houses. Oh, yeah. And I never have the right stuff at my other house, my mom's house, my dad's house. Mm -hmm. And I am done. And, and she said, I'll go back and forth every three months. I'll get together with the other parent during that time. So I don't lose touch with them, but I will not move. And I think, you know, we don't we don't think how hard it is on children. I know, because it's like, back you know, forth. mom has her house, dad has his house. And then it's like we just, you know, the kids have to go back and forth. Yeah, yeah. And let the child know that he has two parents, two parents who love him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are really good. Um, Actually, one question I had you mentioned about security. What are some things that you see that um, parents do to help um, their kids feel secure? 
Well, I think if they if they know that if the, if there if there's some predictability, so they know that mom will be there at a certain time or dad will be there at a certain time, that they will have dinner. Um, however, however you serve that, I think back when I was a single parent, I'm not sure I was so great with <laughs> with having dinner on the table, but that's that's really I think important. Um, letting them know you love them, mm-hmm. um, being being free to love them. Yeah. Um, letting them know that they are free to love the other parent. Right. And that they can talk to you about the other parent. Yeah, because there could be a lot of anxiety, I think, if they feel like they have to filter, right. you know, or that yes. you're going to feel bad if I say that I like to do something that mom or dad Exactly, so, right? yeah. Um, yeah, there's, you know, and... <laughs> You can let them know that you disapprove it just with a look, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, you're not going to tell me that. No. Are you? Um, but they should be free to to be with each of you. Um, make sure that if school starts at nine o'clock, they are there on time. Uh, if you have a dentist appointment, make sure they get there. Uh, I think that that all these things provide stability and security. Yeah, or even just at night, like when work is done, like be fully focused on your it's, your kids. It's a great one. Yeah, you know, for the attention, so they feel like they're not having to fight for your attention. And that's hard. I mean, maybe you've worked all day. Mm-hmm. Now you'd like to have a little peace. <laughs> oh yeah, I got to do the. <laughs> Yeah, but if at least they can, you know, say, oh, mom needs a half hour to wind down and, you know, then, you know, they, you know, I have mom to read me books and, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. eat dinner with me and I know I have her undivided attention and they can, they can count on that, right? Right, yes. Um, So, Joan, you know, we've talked, you know, about the, we've covered the best interest factors, the different types of parenting time, different schedules. What are some, I guess, um, other things to consider in parenting plans that you wouldn't think of? Well, you might consider how you're going to pay for extraordinary medical expenses. And those would be medical expenses that um, perhaps aren't covered by insurance or that the doctor um, charges that you're not, you're not quite prepared for. So how are you going to pay? Are you going to divide those? Are you going to, is one person going to pay them? Are you going to set up a fund to cover them uh, in a, so you have that money saved in advance? Also, life insurance. Um, we usually put in the the separation agreement part of your parenting plan, the money part. Uh, how much life insurance you're going to carry, naming the other parent as the beneficiary in trust for the children, so that if one, if you were to die, the surviving parent wouldn't have the full responsibility for the children, so they would still be taken care of. We talked a little bit about extracurricular activities, but Mm -hmm. some of those get very expensive and you want to agree on them before you make an, uh, before you make a commitment to pay for them. Um, Horseback riding would be one of them, (laughs) but skiing uh, or a kid in hockey or right. Any of the club sports, they're really expensive. And are you going to share those or how are you going to do that? Think about it in advance. Some people even write in how they're going to buy a car for it the child or who's going to pay for the wedding. I always like that. Oh, that's not really. <laughs> that's looking way down the line. Yeah. You might have special religious training and ceremonies that are expensive. Do they have extraordinary clothing expenses? As they get older, mm-hmm. your daughter's going to go to a prom. Yeah. Who pays uh, for the prom dress? Right. right? Yeah. Right. Who pays for the pictures? Yeah. Uh, and then are they going to have a car? Private school tuition. Is that, is that a factor in your life? Post-secondary college expenses, um, a, a judge cannot order you to pay for college for your child, but some parents will write that in right. and make um, arrangements to put money each month into a savings account or um, for, for, not a 401k. Oh, yeah, like a, um, a 529 account. Thank you, 529 account. Yeah. And, and that's always a good idea, uh, even if you... You don't have to commit to paying it, but it's good, good to think, good to plan ahead. Yeah, and also I think it's you know should be clear to everyone that um, you you know a cohort can't order you to pay for post secondary education, but if you make an agreement to, then Thank that you. can be enforced mm-hmm. with the court. And I've seen from the lawyer's perspective 
you know, like, and also the client's perspective, like make it, make those provisions pretty clear. You know, what does it mean, you know, as far as what's included in the post-secondary education expense um, that's to be divided between the parents? And when does it end? Exactly. When does that obligation end? I, I think that that's, that's a good point, and it kind of brings us back to the beginning. This is a really important document. It, it, you are creating obligations for yourself that will last a long time. Uh, and you want it to be very clear. You want it to be um, concise, if you will. And I think it's a good idea to have a lawyer review it Agreed. before you submit it to the court. Mm -hmm. Better to draft your own, in my opinion than to have a judge do it uh, just because the judge doesn't know your family yeah. and you do or your child or and what your child, child really needs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. joan thank you so much for appearing today on divorce at You're altitude welcome. i really appreciate it you gave some great information on parenting plans how to stay child focused um, if our listeners would like to get a hold of you what's the best way for them to reach you uh, my phone number is 303-830-0171 and i am not doing I'm mediating child-related issues, but that's all I'm Good mediating. to know. And I do do consulting, if you'd like that. that Great. Be part of your plan. Great. Well, thank you, John, so much. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.